This Embryology Highlight Screencast, Cardiovascular Development 3, deals with artery development. Vessel formation begins with blood island development within splanctic mesoderm of the yolk sac and the allantois. Later in development, blood formation will take place in the liver and the spleen and ultimately in bone marrow. The transition from fetal vessels to adult vessels involves the formation of new blood vessels, the merger of existing vessels, and ultimately the degeneration of many early vessels. This schematic illustrates blood island formation. Here we have splanctic mesoderm associated with the endoderm, and these mesenchymal cells will undergo a transformation, a commitment to become blood-forming cells, hemocytoblasts. They will induce surrounding mesenchyme cells to form endothelial blasts, and so we have these blood islands. They enlarge and they coalesce, and then they bud to form early vessels. The results of early blood vessel formation is shown below. There are paired vessels. There are paired veins draining the yolk sac and the allantois, and paired veins draining the embryo itself. Uh, and then on the arterial side, there are paired ventral aorta and paired dorsal aorta, except in this region where, endocardial, where an endocardial tube has formed. The paired dorsal aorta and ventral aorta are connected by a series of aortic arches, two of which are shown here. Caudal to the aortic arches, these dorsal aorta will fuse, and the individual aortic arches, the third, the fourth, and the sixth, will become major vessels. This is a colored view of that image we just looked at. The veins are in blue, and you can see everything's paired. Vitellin circulation draining the yolk sac, the umbilical circulation draining the allantois, and paired cranial and caudal cardinal veins draining the embryo itself. Here we have a single endocardial tube formed by merger of paired vessels, but then we have paired ventral aorta and paired dorsal aorta that are going to give off branches to the yolk sac and the allantois. They are connected by aortic arches that are going to become vessels. The right and left paired dorsal aorta will fuse caudal to the aortic arches. So each dorsal aorta gives off intersegmental arteries that go up and bifurcate and, and anastomose with one another. And these will become the lumbar and intercostal arteries and the seventh cervical will become a subclavian artery. This image shows transections through an embryo at different stages of development from early to later and the arteries are colored red. Initially there are paired dorsal aorta. Each dorsal aorta gives off an inter intersegmental branch dorsally and ventral. Also we see lateral branches coming off, for example, to the kidney. Dorsal aorta are fusing together, so at later stages we just have one aorta, the adult situation. Meanwhile, the dorsal intersegmental branches are going to become intercostal or lumbar branches. The ventral branches uh, merging or one of them dropping out and becoming the branches such as the celiac and cranial mesenteric arteries that we find supplying the gut. The lateral branches will become, for example, renal branches or branches to the lateral wall. Cranially in the embryo, the aortic arches connect the ventral aorta with the paired dorsal aorta. And bilaterally, then, those aortic arches become significant adult vessels. The third aortic arch will become the common carotid artery and internal carotid artery. The external carotid will bud off those. On the left side, the fourth aortic arch will become the arch of the aorta, and the right one will become a subclavian artery. And the sixth aortic arch will become pulmonary arteries bilaterally. And on the left side, there will be a persistent connection to the dorsal aorta and that will become 
ductus arteriosus. This image illustrates the disposition of aortic arches. Over here we see that initially there, there could be a total of six aortic arches, and in some species that would be true. But as some aortic arches are developing, others are already degenerating. And so we end up then with the third, the fourth, and the sixth aortic arches that are actually going to become adult vessels. That is going to involve a degeneration of the earlier. This is the first and second, and they are gone now. Here was the third arch, and that is going to persist. So it's going to involve a degeneration of aortic arches, and it's going to involve selective degeneration of connections of the dorsal aorta. So this degeneration is going to free this arch to move up toward the head. Here we see intersegmental arteries when they anastomose with one another. And in the cervical region, many of these will degenerate, but one will persist and enlarge, and that will become a subclavian artery. And meanwhile, the anastomotic segments will become, for example, a vertebral artery we see that the sixth aortic arch is becoming a pulmonary artery going to the developing lung and on the left side which we are looking at it maintains its connection to the dorsal aorta and that will be the ductus arteriosus. This image shows in dotted lines that some vessels have degenerated and so here we see the third arch that has detached from the rest of the dorsal aorta. It develops into the internal carotid artery, and uh, actually this is the internal carotid artery here, and then the external carotid artery buds off that, and so the proximal end is a common carotid artery. On the left side, we have the fourth arch forming the arch of the aorta, and it be will become the subclavian artery on the right side. And here in purple, is a pulmonary trunk and the sixth arches will become pulmonary arteries and the continuity will degenerate on the right side but on the left side it will uh, form the ductus arteriosus. So this is the left side because we're looking at a ventral view of these aortic arches. Early in the embryo this aortic arch formation, uh, development into vessels, took place ventral to the pharynx. But as the heart migrates back into the thorax later in development, uh, and these vessels then get pulled back toward the th into the thorax, the innervation of the larynx by the cordolaryngeal nerve uh, gets caught by these arches, and that gets pulled back into the thorax as well. And so we have a recurrent laryngeal nerve, a branch off the vagus nerve that has to come all the way down in the thorax and then run back to innervate the larynx. On the left side, it hooks around the ductus arteriosus, and which will become the ligamentum arteriosum in the adult. But on the right side, there is no connection between the pulmonary artery and the right fifth arch and so it hooks around the fourth arch and that fourth arch is going to become the right subclavian artery and so the recurrent laryngeal nerve will hook around the subclavian artery on the right side but on the left side it will hook around the ligamentum arteriosum. This is an enlarged view of that vessel formation. We are looking at a ventral view and so the left side is to your right. Uh, here is the fused ventral aorta region, and back here is fused dorsal aorta, and where the aortic arches region is, between here and here, we have a aortic arches connecting from ventral to dorsal. If we look at the sixth aortic arch, which is shown in purple here, it had a connection from ventral to dorsal. On the left side, the sixth aortic arch becomes pulmonary artery and ductus arteriosus. On the right side, 
the sixth aortic arch becomes pulmonary artery, but the connection to the dorsal aorta degenerates. The fourth aortic arch on the left side becomes the arch of the aorta. It continues and joins the aorta. It gives off a prominent seventh intercostal artery, which will become the left subclavian artery. Meanwhile, the right fourth arch connects to dorsal aorta, but the dorsal aorta connection to the rest of the aorta degenerates, and that frees this vessel up. Bilaterally, the third aortic arch loses its connection to the fourth arch, and it uh, gives rise to the internal carotid artery, and the external carotid artery buds off it. One consequence of this vessel formation, which is very complex and is also complicated by the fact that these vessels are going to move back into the thorax, is that this is happening very early when these are tiny vessels in a small embryo, and as, as everything enlarges and these move back, uh, you can get various combinations of these. And so it sh should not be surprising to see different variations of the branching in this area. And this is illustrated here on the right, where we see for different species different patterns of formation. Here in the horse and cow, there's one brachiocephalic trunk, and from that, all of these, uh, the two subclavian and the two common carotid arteries are given off. All of these kind of merge together during growth. In the pig, we have the two common carotids coming together, and so there's a bicarotid trunk. And in the dog, we see all of this has come together, this region, to form one brach brachiocephalic trunk. And then coming off, secondly, is the the left subclavian artery. And so the point is, it's not surprising to see different patterns in these major vessels anterior to the heart. Another consequence of this very complicated aortic arch vessel formation with the selective degenerations is that things can go wrong. The vessels will deliver blood okay, but if the wrong things degenerate and other vessels persist, the esophagus can be trapped, as you see here. So this will show up in the neonatal animal where they can't handle large volumes of food and that food is regurgitated. Here we can see a couple of possibilities for compressing the esophagus. This is the esophagus, shown in yellow. Here is the early an early stage of fetal development, and here's a later stage that would be comparable to the adult pattern. We're looking at a dorsal view now, so the right side is on the right and the left side is on the left. And so normally what should happen is there should be a degeneration at this point, freeing up this right fourth aortic arch to become a subclavian artery, as you see here. The sixth arch will persist uh, and form a ductus arteriosus connecting to the fourth aortic arch. This is the normal pattern that you'd expect, and you can see that the esophagus is not entrapped at all by that normal arrangement. This diagrams the problem that we see on the right. What has happened is that de the degeneration has not occurred here. Is it it has occurred here, that has the breakdown. We end up with this arrangement where the esophagus is trapped. The fourth aortic arch on the right side has become the arch of the aorta. On the left side, it has become a subclavian artery. The ductus arteriosus on the left side then is going to make contact with the right aortic arch, and that is going to result in an entrapped esophagus. Another possibility of entrapping the esophagus is shown below, where instead of the degeneration occurring here, it occurs up here. That means now that the subclavian artery goes across the esophagus and traps it. None of these anomalies are fatal because blood still can get from where it's coming to where it's going. They just create problems 
following birth because of the esophagus entrapment, which generally can be treated by surgery. The intersegmental arteries that are given off by the dorsal aorta give rise to the subclavian artery and also the vertebral artery, which is a branch of the subclavian. The subclavian artery comes from the seventh cervical intersegmental artery. Caudal to that, we have intersegmental arteries forming intercostal arteries in the thorax and lumbar arteries. The arteries that we see in the abdomen are from ventral intersegmental arteries. Telen arteries, which supply the yolk sac in the embryo, persist and form the cranial mesenteric artery. Actually, it's the right vitellin artery will be the cranial mesenteric artery. The left one will degenerate. Also, the umbilical arteries that supply the allantois and the placenta will persist and supply the urinary bladder. They will degenerate distal to the urinary bladder. And external and internal iliac arteries will form by buds that grow out and become these major vessels. Here we see examples of a few intersegmental arteries and that anastomose with one another. The seventh one will become the subclavian artery and these will degenerate, but this connection will ma be maintained. That will become a vertebral artery. Meanwhile, ventral intersegmental arteries that are supplying the yolk sac, uh, the right one will become the cranial mesenteric artery, and the umbilical arteries will go as far as the urinary bladder. External and internal iliacs will bud off those. Here in these transections through an embryo, we see ventral segmental arteries going to the yolk sac and the gut and uh, the right one will persist and become a cranial mesenteric artery. Meanwhile, the dorsal intersegmental arteries will be paired and will become lumbar arteries and intercostal arteries. And so that concludes this embryology highlight screencast concerning artery development.